This is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. With me today is Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum, who is one of the most frequently quoted integrative pain and fibromyalgia medical authorities in the world. He's the author of 10 books, including the new edition of the best-selling From Fatigued to Fantastic, and the popular free smartphone app, Cures A to Z. He's the lead author of eight studies on effective treatment for fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And he appears often as a guest on news and talk shows nationwide, including Good Morning America, The Dr. Oz Show, Oprah and Friends, CNN, and Fox News Health. You can follow his work at vitality101.com and nfatigue.com. So this is a wide ranging episode covering a lot of territory from general fatigue to the specifics of post-exertional malaise in chronic fatigue syndrome, to uh, supplements, to post-COVID syndrome or long COVID and effective treatments for that, and some of the latest research that Dr. Teitelbaum has been involved in over the last couple of years. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it and get a lot out of this episode, so enjoy it. So welcome back to the show, Dr. Teitelbaum. Such a pleasure to have you again. Ari, it's always good to be with you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, first of all, let's talk about why there is, in your words, a perfect storm for people suffering from chronic fatigue these days. What's going on in our world? You know, and, and obviously COVID's a new layer to that story. But uh, w- what is this perfect storm that you talk about in your work? Well, if you take a look, food processing, which includes 140 pounds of sugar per person, adamant or dietes here, white flour, basically half of the vitamins and minerals are removed in food processing. And the diet just doesn't have that much left over uh, to give us what I need. Virtually every American out there is vitamin and and, uh, mineral deficient. So simple things like that, sleep. The average night sleep until light bulbs were invented was nine hours a night. Now it's six and three quarter. That's a 30% pay cut. Our immune system has to deal with 85,000 new chemicals in the environment. And meanwhile, the speed and stress of life has increased. The media seems to think when I was a kid, uh, the media advertising mantra was sex sells. You wanted to sell something. You had good looking girls, good looking guys sitting there right next to the car or the beer or whatever it is you wanted to sell. Uh, The current media mantra seems to be fear and divisiveness sells. Mm -hmm. If they can scare you to death and make you hate half the population, they've done their job because that's good for business. And the I I like fiction. I like fiction as much as the next person. I, I read a couple hundred pages of fiction a day, but I prefer my fiction to be labeled fiction. (laughs) <laughs> so I, you know, and I don't care which side of the aisle you're reading, you know, whether it's the right or the left. And I, again, I don't, my politics are that the right wing and left wing are part of the same bird. A healthy society will be have 40% of people who like stability, 40% who represent change, and that pendulum 20% in the middle. And that's how it should be. That's why it is that way all over the mm-hmm. world throughout history. Mm-hmm. Um, but this whole thing is like a tree with a, roots of the tree liking liking the stability and the branches and the trunk of the tree and then the leaves and the flowering edges like can change and right now we have one half of the tree trying to cut off the other half on both sides it's crazy yeah so yeah. there's this tai chi move i recommend when you're watching the news uh, or listening to the news uh news and you find yourself grinding your teeth and it just feels really bad is to kind of take take a big breath center, reach out to the side, grab the remote control and hit off. So, you know, and your feelings will tell you, I mean, these are all nice people on both sides out there. It's just, this is what the job is these days. Um, And it just, you know, Mark Twain put it very well. If you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. But if you do watch the news or read the news, you're misinformed. And it it hasn't changed. So if you want to help your energy skyrocket, and you'll be amazed at how little you're missing. Uh, because anything that's important, you're going to hear about anyway. Um, it's just all this other nonsense that they're making up that just turn it off. Mm-hmm. And COVID is one more example of that. COVID, important virus, important to be cautious. But they're not teaching caution and they're not teaching what to do. They're teaching, they're trying to scare people to death. It's kind of like the uh, 
during the Nazi Germany when they attacked uh, Britain with you know tons of bombs and they had the bombings, and it would be the equivalent as if Winston Churchill was going around going panic, everybody panic, 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 and you know, and people are saying we can hide in the airway shelters. No, there's no proof that that works. It's like, are you insane? But this is a media approach today, so turn it off. Yeah, you will be amazed at how much more energy you have. So this is kind of the context for why 31 percent of adult Americans not just have fatigue, but have severe fatigue. Mm -hmm. You know, most everybody would want more energy these days. Um, and why two to four percent are just totally out of the game. They've tripped a circuit breaker called chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And all of these are easy to treat. It, I can give you a simple way in one minute to double your energy. Uh, there's just all kinds of things. Uh, this is very easy to take care of if you know what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in your work, you in your book, Fatigued to Fantastic, uh, you talk about the SHINE protocol, S-H-I-N-E. What does that stand for? What is this all about? And what kind of results do you get? Well, the key to optimizing energy is S is sleep. H in shine is hormonal support and optimization. I is infections. N is nutritional support. And E is exercise as able. Um, so for most people, a good, hearty, healthy exercise program. Um, for people with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, they some can only do 50 steps in a day uh, without getting what's called post-exertional malaise. So it's as feels good. Mm -hmm. um, a simple way to begin, if you want to double energy, uh, we've, we've just uh, pub, uh, finished our fourth study on uh, looking at people with the most severe fatigue, including those with post-viral fatigue. So we, we had a series of four studies in the last two years. Okay, let's let's get back to exercise. I want to talk about this a bit more because among people with MECFS, exercise is a controversial subject, and um, there are there is a segment of people in that world who really reject the idea that exercise is helpful. They insist exercise is harmful to them. It creates post-exertional malaise. If they do any even a little bit of exercise, it's bad for them. And they even, uh, in some cases, attack people who are recommending exercise as being irresponsible and, and so on. They're just sort of vehemently entrenched in a position that exercise is sort of universally bad for people with MECFS. Have you, have you encountered that type of thinking before? And what, what comments do you have on it? Or do you, do you have any sort of uh, rebuttal to that position? I'm not going to give a rebuttal. I'm going to give understanding to both sides. Okay. You have to understand they're concern was not about exercise for conditioning. Their concern is that there is a economic movement in um, the United Kingdom that tried to invalidate the illness that basically were saying these are, they, they would, would one side, yeah, they're really sick, but no, they're not really sick. Just give them exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy, but cut off any other treatment put them in insane asylums if they even uh, go overseas to get treatments or if they get treatments for their children besides cognitive behavioral therapy and exercise, arrest the parents. They literally were arresting parents and putting the children in insane asylums because they tried anything besides those two. The cognitive behavioral therapy and the graded exercise program were not used as a means to go ahead and add something to help conditioning and to help the mind-body component. It was basically an abusive attack by well-meaning people who wanted the business all for themselves. Sorry, but this is a simple politics of the thing. And because and they were denying people their, their health insurance benefits. They were uh, denying people disability benefits. So the insurance companies are happy to go, oh, they're just crazy. We don't have to pay them get going. Right. And they published a couple studies that were some of the biggest piece of crap studies ever done in human history. Is that a technical scientific term? Yes, it goes right <laughs> after the p-value. The p-value is this is a piece of crap. Okay. Um, it, they were horribly done studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were used to basically abuse people in the community. Mm. So from that context, and these are nice people, they're not bad people. They're just, if you're a psychiatrist and you're saying, you know, everybody's going heart disease, you've got that and you've got that for your neurology thing or for MS, we want ours. And this population is ours, damn it. Mm -hmm. And whether they like it or not, 
So anyway, I'm giving you, since you're painting one picture on one side, yeah. I'm going to paint the picture on the other side. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. That's important. And then so, so it, that, what you just described created this response among some people to, to insist, no, this is real. This is not just something that's solvable by doing exercise. Yes. And they attack. So what, what do I find in real life? Mm -hmm. uh, people have a certain amount of energy and they can use that energy to condition. <clears throat> Most of us can make as much more energy to condition than we actually go out and exercise. So there's not a limit really to our conditioning in real life for most of us. Uh, if we just get off our behinds and go for a walk and go for you know, whatever. Um, the problem is that the energy production is very limited in CFS and fibromyalgia. And the instead of conditioning beyond a certain point that they crash and burn, they have post-exertional malaise in their bedroom for two, three days. That is not hurting you. It's not causing any permanent harm when that happens, that's really important to know. And it, it will leave you wiped out for two, three days. But the thing is, if it leaves people afraid to exercise at all, and then they decondition, which is even worse. Right. Because deconditioning in this disease, especially with the autonomic dysfunction is horrific. Right. So the middle path that I yes. recommend is begin by walking 50 steps, see how much you can walk comfortably each day if you have CFS and ME, fibromyalgia, and feel good tired after and better the next day. Slowly increase it by 50 steps a day. When you get to that post-exertional malaise thing, cut it back 15 to 20% so you feel safe, rest for a couple of days, and then maintain that program, even if it's just 50 steps a day that you can do, whatever you can do, do that. What you'll find is after eight weeks on the SHINE protocol, which we're going to talk about the details, um, your energy production will skyrocket. Our randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study uh, showed that using the SHINE protocol, which is a comprehensive thing, there's nothing expensive in it, so doctors didn't hear about it. It was all low cost. Um, people's energy was skyrocketing. 91% of people had a 75% average improvement in energy. Then you can start to condition and you can increase your walking by 50 steps every couple of days as feels comfortable. Uh, when you get up to 5,000 steps, you're doing more than the average American. When you get up to 10,000 steps, which is five miles, you're up at the optimal levels, so to speak. So, you know, but the thing is, even if you can just get your way up to 500 steps a day or a thousand for a lot of people out there, that beats the hell out of being house bound and bedridden. So the, the bottom line is listen to your body, slowly increase and give your body what it needs to produce energy so you can condition. Right. And I, I know that you, you kind of alluded to this, but I think it's worth emphasizing because of this, this subset of people that are entrenched in this idea that exercise is sort of universally bad. Be extremely wary of deconditioning because th that in itself, that the complete avoidance of physical activity itself creates enormous harm over time. I think the word enormous fits. Okay. So uh, let's talk about, let's, if we can jump around a bit, let's talk about the H hormones. Uh, so what, what's going on hormonally in, in people with chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, and what kinds of things are you doing to correct those uh, hormonal abnormalities? So here's the thing. The, this is an energy crisis where energy levels drop way down and it can be triggered by anything, infections, uh, even poor exercise, poor nutrition, severe stress, anything that drains energy. When the energy goes below a certain level, the area in the body that uses the most energy for its size malfunctions. Uh, and that's a, a place called the hypothalamus. It's an almond-sized circuit breaker in the brain that controls sleep, hormones, and autonomic function. So your entire hormone system goes down. Now, the labs are geared to what's called two standard deviations. It's funny, I'll like sort of four or 500 doctors at a time, and I love Ari asking the question, where do the normal ranges come from on lab tests? And it's like 400 deer in the headlights looking back and they're like, uh, I don't know. And most of the doctors, all they do, they'd rather you stayed home and just sent them the lab results. They just want to look at the lab results. If the lab results are in the normal range, you're fine, even if you're dead. Right. It, in fact, it's funny. And in, um, in residency, if somebody died, as long as the tests are okay, you got a pat on the back. Um, and I said, well, you did a great job. The tests are fine. Too, too bad the person died. 
and that's that's really kind of what it is. It was called dying with Harvard lights or with Harvard electrolytes. If the test looked perfect, you did a good job. Patient yeah. stud, too bad. Yeah. Um, so the tests, the way we use uh, testing for hormones is if you are in the lowest 5% of the normal range, it's called two standard deviations. Uh, so if you're in the lowest 2.5% of the normal range or the top 2.5% of the normal range, that's 5% outside of normal, you are defined as abnormal and sick. But if you're in the lowest 3% of the population, you're fine. <laughs> and to give an idea, uh, if your shoe size, the normal range for shoe sizes is 5 to 13, because that's two standard deviations. Um, so, Ari, I'm going to give you a size six shoe. You're going to go to the shoe doctor, and the shoe doctor will check your shoe size and say it's a size six. Ari, it's in the normal range. No problem. Yeah. You know, if, if I can interject one, one thing here, one little data point from the research that I've encountered, I don't know if you've ever seen this. Uh, it's not really a study. It's more like a compilation of the evidence that was used to form evidence-based guidelines for physicians treating fatigue. And it's called Fatigue and Overview. Uh, and it was published in the American Journal of uh, the Journal of the American Family Physician, something along those lines, uh, maybe about 10 years ago. And they talk about the four key recommendations that they're considering, quote unquote, evidence-based recommendations for doctors to treat their patients with fatigue, which are um, cognitive behavioral therapy, a recommendation to walk half an hour a day, um, antidepressants, and stimulants. That's pretty yes. much all they got. And then, yeah. and then the other thought, the other part of this paper that's <laughs> really fascinating and remarkable is they talk about recommendation recommendations for um, tests to run with patients with chronic fatigue. And they basically say, you know, unless there's some indication of why you should perform some other sort of more abnormal tests, like, you know, there's, you, you suspect tuberculosis or something like that, then you run a tuberculosis test, but otherwise uh, you do standard, st standard blood panel testing. And they say in this paper that only 5% of people with chronic fatigue who go through uh, standard blood panel testing show up with any abnormality. In other words, 95 out of 100 people have perfectly normal lab test results. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we shouldn't do anything for them because they're not right. sick because our tests are normal. And they have a size six shoe on. So that 300 pound Texas guy who's six foot seven, it's a size six shoe, damn it. And the it's normal and we should not be wasting our money on this crazy little asshole yeah. See, the, the, you get the, the cognitive dissonance. Uh, also, you have to look at when we look at evidence based medicine, we have to understand that the, what we're looking at is is a p value less than 0 0.05? Is there a 95% statistical probability of something working? Now, the thing is that for some illnesses, if you're looking to get, you know, um, look at COVID, for example, um, we hear over and over ivermectin doesn't work, Luvox doesn't work. It's crazy because what the studies show is that these the, the last study is came um out out of 20 hospitals showed a 91 percent probability that ivermectin decreased death by 70 percent mm -hmm. the conclusion was ivermectin doesn't work That's, <laughs> it's incredibly unscientific it's a religious statement that instead of saying 91% probability of works would be nice if it was 95 percent um and the studies are routinely underpowered you have to whether something works in medicine has as much to do with how many people there are in the study as in how clinically effective it is yeah. so yeah. if you go ahead and right now what is sadly happening is anything that is cheap just notice anything that's low cost for COVID is being attacked because this is a gold mine for the pharmaceutical industry for whenever we get the new drugs out that are going to be very very expensive and we don't want anything in the way. Oh, but and Dr. Teitelbaum, you're just a conspiracy theorist and ivermectin is just a horse dewormer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't have a bias on either side except what works. Like I say, my politics is that right wing and left wing are part of the same bird. I'm I with you. My, my, bi my bias is towards scientific truth. And it's very clear That's that true. what's gone on in the last two years is very much opposed to that. Yes, they're, they're setting up a study now uh, at Duke University to I'm a massive study now uh, of Luvox ivermectin and uh, a steroid, which is the wrong steroid for inhaling. Um, 
but you look at, I was saying, yay, okay. And then I looked at the study details on clinicaltrials.gov. People are being enrolled in the study 11 or 12 days after the test turns positive, they're starting the treatment. Right. It's insane. I just, had COVID. Just, just explain that to, to, to people so they, they get why that distinction is important. Well, I had COVID five weeks ago. Um, I took my ivermectin and my Luvox, and I took some nutritional support. I had a wonderful four days reading tea, reading my book in bed and having some tea and stuff. Um, and by day five, I was healthy and back at work. Okay. Nice. Now, can you imagine if at day 12 after all of this, when I was healthy and back at work and feeling great, they gave me the test medicine. It would show no effect. I took the medicine on day one of the test being positive and was feeling great for the four days, but resting. Yeah. Um, it's called a study that is designed to fail. Well, the, the con conversely, the other side of this is, let's say you had gotten severely ill and you were 10 days into it. Like I have a friend right now who's um, a good friend of mine whose wife got hit pretty hard by COVID. She's been in bed for a week and, you know, he... He and the kids were both fine, but his wife just had it very severely. Um, let's say she's on day 10 now. She's already progressed into severe illness. There's a huge distinction between starting a medication then, once that condition has already taken hold, already caused a lot of damage in the body, and you've already progressed into a severe state. Not that she's in a really severe state, but she's, she's going to recover fine. But let's say she was in a real severe state by day 10. Now you start the medication. There's a big difference between that and versus starting it on day one or two or three. Yes. Uh, an analogy that is quite apt here is if you're doing a study of fire engines for buildings that are on fire and you purposely design the study so that we will send out the fire engines 12 hours after the fire is reported. Mm hmm and say, say you work for company, for builders who like buildings to burn down, mm -hmm. you know, and you design the study. And we sent out the fire trucks five hours, 12 hours after the alarm, and it had no effect. Building was really burnt to the ground, so fire trucks don't work. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, what I'm amazed with is how they can be said repeatedly with a straight face. But yeah. anyway, so the bottom line is evidence-based medicine. We have to understand that the United, what we're calling evidence-based medicine in the United States is not scientific. Um, in fact, uh, if it's something is placebo controlled, it increases the accuracy of the study 30%. If it's randomized, it adds another 30%. If a large company pays for the study, it decreases the accuracy 2,400% to 4,100% in the <laughs> literature. Therefore, if you're really looking at evidence-based medicine and you want to exclude things that are not randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, then you have to eliminate anything paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. Well, yeah, and, and not to digress too much, but that's highly relevant to some of the stuff that's going on in the world, right? right now with with certain uh, injections that are being rolled out to most of the entire world which were in fact funded by pharmaceutical companies yes and again i'm not against the vaccine i i don't recommend it in children it's just the, the science and the equation one in four million children this was as of two months ago mm -hmm. died from covid you were more people died of being strangled by their bed sheets then children, healthy children died of COVID. Now, right. children with leukemia is a different story, but healthy children, um, there's no acceptable risk from the vaccine given how children do fine with COVID. Right. And, and therefore the equation, just, there's no way to make it work to make sense for children to be vaccinated unless they're ill yes. uh, or they need to, to go to school. Um, the baseline vaccine I did take, mostly so I could visit my daughter in Berlin um, and they let me in. Uh, the boosters, mm, yeah, I'm 31, I was born 70 years ago roughly, but uh, I didn't bother the booster. I'm not gonna bother the booster. If you don't mind me asking, when did you get the, the vaccine, the, the two initial doses? I just did the one. I still feel the Johnson and Johnson is better. Not be, it may not give quite as much protection, but it gives plenty of protection. And it's a much better known kind of a thing with the exception of women who are age 20 to 40, where there's an increased risk of clotting. Uh, so in May, I did the Johnson and Johnson. In May of, of 2021. Correct. 
Okay. And you just got COVID five weeks ago, you said? About, yeah. Okay. Have you seen the, not to digress too much, but the, <laughs> the um, have you seen the data on the sort of the decrease in efficacy of the vaccines, how, how rapidly they decline? Um, well, that's, most, why, that, that's why I'm telling people don't bother with a booster because unless you're prepared to take the booster every two months for the rest of your life. Right. And, and as we see with chemotherapy, with vaccines, the more doses you get, the less effective and the more toxic. That's right. Um, over time. So again, I leave it up to each individual's personal preference. It's not a horrible thing either way. Yeah. Um, it's just been politicized. Yes, indeed. Okay. So, so I, we go I, back? Would, <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to talk to you for another hour about COVID related stuff, but let's jump back to hormones. So you're dealing with these sort of an, an overall suppressed level of hormones. What are some of the key hormones and what are some of the interventions you use to address that? Number one, the thyroid, which is your body's gas pedal. Again, the blood tests are meaningless because of the tests rely on the hypothalamic function being accurate, and they're not. So the TSH is a total nonsense test. It means nothing in this disease. Um, the free T4, which is actual thyroid level, most people are down in the lowest four to five percentile. So the doctors say they're fine. They have that size six, uh, or a normal income is, starts at 8,000. If you have an income over eighty eight thousand dollars a year, you're in the normal range. Poverty is sixteen thousand and goes up from there. Most people have a thyroid level of about eighty one hundred dollars a year, so to speak. They're kind of right on the low end. So, how do you tell if you need thyroid hormone? Tired, achy, weight gain, cold intolerance. Any two of those, you deserve a trial of thyroid hormone. Adrenal, that's the stress handler. Again, the test for that. It's not enough to be in the lowest 2% of the population. You have to be in the lowest one out of 100,000 to be abnormal. It has to be so low that it literally can kill you. So it has to be, the level has to be over six. Most people are on 22 in the morning. If it's under six, it's abnormal and it can kill you. If it's 6.1, it's totally fine. 5.9, life-threatening, 6.1, totally normal. I have several times seen the labs accidentally do two of the same test on the same person from the same tube of blood, they're routinely four points apart if you do two of the same test on the same tube of blood. 5.9 life-threatening, 6.1, totally healthy, no problem if you're bedridden even. So how do you tell if you need adrenal support? Do you get irritable when hungry or hangry? That's the best way to tell, that irritability when hungry. Um, and if you're, if you're in divorce uh, lawyer land, if you're in marriage counseling, so often it's because people have low blood sugar from the low adrenal. And if you simply give them adrenal support, they often, their marriages get a lot better because they don't have these claws come out whenever their blood sugar goes down. Um, and there's a bunch of other symptoms, recurrent sore throats, crass and go stress, low blood pressure, dizzy, outstanding. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question on that. Um, I, I happen to have done an, a, an extraordinarily deep dive into the literature. Probably, I, I can't imagine there's more than a handful of people who have spent more time on the literature on this, this topic of the relationship of, of cortisol, adrenal function, HPA axis function, and chronic fatigue syndromes. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as I have, maybe there's a handful, but, uh, I spent probably a good year of my life just digging through and analyzing that research. Mm -hmm. And, um, the idea that, that low cortisol levels have are, you know, sort of the cause, you know, along with the, the sort of adrenal fatigue, uh, hypothesis has been around for 30, 40 years or so. And it was tested pretty heavily. Um, there's close to 70 studies that have been done around the world comparing most of these studies basically compare levels of cortisol um, between people with a fatigue syndrome and that might be chronic fatigue syndrome or there's other studies where they've looked at burnout syndrome clinical burnout or mm -hmm. um, stress related exhaustion disorder they, there's a few different names that they go by in the, in the literature um, and they look at the cortisol levels between the person with the the people with the fatigue syndrome versus normal, healthy people, you know, sort of age matched, gender matched and all that. Um, and overwhelmingly that the research supports no discernible difference. Now, of course there are some in, so to, to break that, what that means down basically means that there's no compelling case that cortisol abnormalities are the sort of primary cause of chronic fatigue. 
but there's also a subset of people who do have uh, cortisol abnormalities. And what's interesting is, is based on, you know, sort of looking at another line of evidence that researchers have tested within this realm, um, based on this idea that low cortisol levels could be to blame for fatigue, some researchers in the past administered hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone, other types of cortisone therapies, um, to people with chronic fatigue. And overwhelmingly, those studies showed no benefit. And, uh, and in addition to that, th th there's even one study really well designed, it was randomized placebo controlled crossover study, kind of as good as science gets. Uh, and they found that even the subset of people who had genuinely had low cortisol also didn't receive benefit from elevating their cortisol levels via hydrocortisone. I'm just curious if you have any insight into why they would have found that. Yep. A couple of things. One of the big things that goes on is that remember we talked about this being a, a stress on the body that drops the energy levels and then trips the circuit breaker. So the thing is that what you're gonna see is a biphasic pattern for cortisol, where you're gonna have with healthy people, more of them will be 16 to 21, where so most people will run, where with this illness is gonna be 11 to 12 to 14 or 27, 28 from the high stress. They're either going to be lower because their adrenals are exhausting or they're going to be higher because they're still facing the stress and making this chronic thing. So if they're sitting at, uh, at 28 and 16, um, then the average of those two extremes is 22, which is where everybody, the healthy people are. So what they're doing is they're, they're adding in these, look, instead of saying, okay, let's look at patterns of where the, uh, these data points fall out and say, oh, they overlap versus, well, we've got most of the people in the middle who are healthy, most of the people at the extremes. And therefore, if you take an average, you're all the same. Got it. But if you um, look at the early work of Dumbdrack and Dale at the NIH, the HPA axis dysfunction was clearly shown yeah. in my own uh, research and in my own uh, clinical practice. We had routinely done cortisone stimulation tests earlier on, and we found that many were low. Yeah. Um, and we do. And so what I'm going to say, Ari, is that the adrenal fatigue is not the cause of the illness, but the illness causes adrenal malfunction and as one contributing factor. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at the doses that were given in most of these studies, um, you, you look at Bennett's study where he gave five milligrams of prednisone, that doesn't work. It's not the right type of steroid. Um, you look at the NIH study where I don't want to say the guy's name because I hate spitting. He never created a single study that was positive and anything that worked, every study he did, it didn't work. He was the only person who routinely booed at NIH conferences who was an, at uh, conferences who was an NIH head because he never came. He never asked experts in the field. He had no familiarity with the disease. And he felt, and he was one who was put in charge when Congress forced um, the NIH to study natural therapies. They took the same guy who crowed that he had no experience or knowledge at all about natural therapies, and they put him in charge of it. He, so, you know, if you look at a study on cortisol, he was giving 25 milligrams a day. If he had asked anybody in the field with any experience, they would have told him that's way too high a dose. It's not going to work. Okay, so you need to go back and look at those deep dive studies and take a look at what was the scatter of the data. Was the proper dosing used? Was the proper form used? Did you see clinic effect? Don't just look at the p-value, but look at clinically, was there a 30% increase in energy, but not powered enough to be statistical significant? So I'm going to invite you to revisit that. Yeah, yeah, no, I have. They, they, did, they did analysis and really found no distinctions, and kind of the theory was mostly abandoned after the early 2000s. There hasn't been really any research in the last 20 years on that because of those negative studies. Um, but it's certainly possible that they're flawed in some way. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention about that research, something that I, I've hardly heard anyone talk about, but is there very solidly in the research, and it's been repeated in many studies, um, in, as, as an explanation for the idea that 
um, you know, sort of to explain a few things. One, why most people with chronic fatigue do not have notable um, HPA axis dysfunction or adrenal dysfunction or, or cortisol abnormalities compared to normal healthy people, according to the bulk of the research. Um, and combined with the fact that administering hydro hydrocortisone um, didn't, in, the studies on that didn't, didn't show benefit. Um, there is a compelling case that low cortisol levels in the subset of people that they do exist in who have um, um, chronic fatigue of various kinds, that it's an epiphenomenon and it's that it's there for other reasons. Um, meaning one compelling, there's a few variables that heavily influence this, but one is circadian rhythm and sleep. <laughs> and the, the single variable of being a late chronotype versus an early chronotype has an absolutely massive impact on cortisol levels and the diurnal curve. So absolutely. when there are studies where they've taken just normal, healthy people, not even people with fatigue or any illness, normal, healthy people, you just compare morning people to night people to night owls. And those studies show that in night owls, they have about half the cortisol in the morning compared to morning people, both normal right. and healthy, but massive difference in, in cortisol levels. There's also right. studies where they've looked at night shift workers or taken people who are uh, not night shift workers and asked them to work night shifts and, and showed that that massively in, um, influences the cortisol curves during the day. And we know there's also a subset of people with chronic fatigue syndrome that have sleep disorders that also heavily influences that. So yeah, I totally concur with what you're saying, with the exception again of, let me go back to the shoe analogy. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going through a population, I'm going through uh, people who feel great. And I'm finding that their shoe scatter is shoe size scatter is normal. And I'm going through people who say my shoes don't fit they're going to have the same shoe size scatter. Mm -hmm. So to simply take a look at that and say the shoe sizes fall out the same, doesn't say that your size seven is wrong. You have to look at what's your shoe size relative to the symptoms. And then if there are, if they are symptomatic, what's the effect of treatment? Right. At the individual level, whereas some at the of, individual level, right. As opposed where, to like uh, the, the, the study where they're taking the averages of a group. Yep, and what you're doing is washing out the thing because you're including people who are not having symptoms of low adrenal mm -hmm. or who have high adrenal and you're just throwing them all together. Right. right. So I'm going to say clinically uh, what you found in our study using the uh, comprehensive protocol, and I can't say that it was just the adrenal treatment. We did have then a randomized double blind placebo controlled study of shine, uh, less than P less than 0 0.0001. So there is data that is part of a larger protocol of works. Uh, we did do pre and post cortisone. and there was no adrenal suppression um, because of the low doses where uh, in Steve's study, he gave the 25 because he didn't ask anybody with any experience and he had none himself. Um, and he did see adrenal suppression. Um, and then it was, well, you we can't give cortisol. Well, you don't give that dose. Nobody in the right mind does that. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you need to look at the data a bit with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, mm -hmm. And I agree, the cortisol and candida, those are the two areas where there's the least data in support of what I'm saying. Right. Um, but the data, you know, there is clearly HPA access dysfunction in the literature. Uh, at yeah, at that. least in a, in a subset of people, for sure. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got to go ahead and break out which group sounds like they have that component mm -hmm. and then test them. You can't just lump them all together. Right. Okay. So any other notable hormonal abnormalities, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, things like that? 70% of men are in the lowest 30th percentile for testosterone. And most women, uh, many women are having estrogen deficiency. Um, so here's the way that you tell for the women and whether they need estrogen and progesterone. Are there fibromyalgia symptoms worse around their menses? Um, I'm not talking about PMS, but the fatigue, the headache, the insomnia, the widespread pain, uh, the brain fog, are those worse around menses? If so, the low estrogen and progesterone are likely contributing. And uh, then a therapeutic trial of bioidentical hormone is warranted. In men, 
Again, the normal range, if your testosterone level is 240, the doctor will tell you you are normal, even if you're 35 years old, when you should be closer to 1,200. No, nope, you're not in the lowest two and a half percent. Does that include 80 year old men? Oh yes, of course. You know, it's um, you know. So I will give bioidentical um, and younger men up to 50. I will give Clomid to stimulate their own testosterone to wake up the hypothalamic function. Mm -hmm. um, older, I will use the bioidentical cream or pellets, um, and the women I'll use the bioidentical hormones. Um, and those, so that's those are the three main hormones. I can give you a dozen other hormones. We could spend a couple hours, but those are the three biggies. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, let's talk about post COVID. So you've become very interested in, in post COVID fatigue. Talk mm -hmm. to me about that. What are, what are your findings on, I guess the, the prevalence of what they call long COVID I've seen, uh, several studies that have very widely varying estimates of the prevalence of, of long COVID or anything from like, I think I've seen 35% down to 2%, uh, depending on how they define it and, you know, the, yeah. the length of time and the, the types of symptoms that they include. Yeah. And some go up to 50%. In real life, it's 15% for, mm -hmm. well, first of all, long COVID is defined as any symptom that persists, which is absurd. Mm -hmm. So you need to break it into subsets. So number one, you have chronic shortness of breath um, or cough. Uh, if you have that, but you don't have fatigue, brain fog, and these other CFS-like symptoms, uh, if you have shortness of breath, get a pulse oximeter, a little finger clip device, or like 20 bucks on Amazon, um, and see what your oxygen saturation is doing uh, during the shortness of breath. If it's 96% or even 95% or higher, and it goes up with exercise, your heart and lungs are probably fine. Um, if it goes, if it's 95, 96 and goes down with exercise, you need to see the cardiologist or the pulmonologist at that point for those with persistent, who had pneumonia and persistent lung symptoms, I will use something called Curamed, which is of highly absorbed curcumin and clinical glutathione to turn off both the inflammation and the free radical. We don't have research for this. It's too early for it. And the average study that's a randomized double blind placebo control study that's used for presentation before the NIH. Per study, the average cost is seventeen million dollars per study. That's so it. It's pocket that's change. Pocket change, <laughs> exactly. Which basically means that only very expensive things can go through that protocol. Um, but so what I'm using is common sense um, because nobody's going to pay. You know, if you have, if you have seventeen million bucks, I'd love to do the study on it. Um, there, there's there's a lot to be said for highly knowledgeable people with a lot of, especially those with a lot of clinical experience who know physiology really, really well and biochemistry really, really well, who are engaging in logical speculation, you know, based on the mechanism of how this symptom, this problem is, is being caused. And we know that these other things act on that mechanism by this, this, and this way we can engage in that sort of logical speculation and often get great results. Right. And then when you use it and you find people get better, Mm -hmm. and it's cheap, it's safe, then I think it's reasonable to do. Yeah. Um, so I give those two. But the thing for those of you who are post uh, have the pneumonia, had the pneumonia and are recovering from that is the research for this type of pneumonia It's called ARDS, basically, um, from numerous other causes, so that it usually heals itself by two years. So the progression is it's normally going to get better on its own. Mm -hmm. um, for those with heart disease, uh, we have the cardiomyopathy, you have the myocarditis, you have, where you have shortness of breath and symptoms of heart failure, um, your oxygen level goes down, your doctor will do what they can, it's not going to be much, but there's four things you can do, um, and there's a fair bit of research looking at ribose uh, for cardiac, basically systolic, uh, diastolic failure actually, um, coenzyme Q10, uh, B vitamins and magnesium, help the energy dynamic of the heart. So those four simple things are low cost. Um, it's funny, I, I live in Hawaii and um, we were met this fellow. Uh, he and his wife were both Mensa types. He was an elderly engineer. And we asked, mom, what made you decide to come? And his wife said, well, the doctor said, my husband has two months to live and there's nothing she can do about it because he has heart failure. And they're mm -hmm. from Alaska. And I said, uh, she said, you're not, going to freeze to death in Alaska. If you're going to die, you'll die where it's warm. So they came to Hawaii. Um, and I told him, you're right. The doctor was right. There's nothing she could do. 
but there's a lot of natural things that have reasonable enough research on it. Maybe not the seventeen million dollar studies, but you know mm -hmm. some that are a million dollar studies and other things. Um, and I said, take those four things. Got an email two years later. Subject line: You saved my life. Wow. This is not rocket science stuff. I've, uh, there's a phone app, Cures A to Z, C U R E S, capital A to Z. That's a free phone app. You look up heart disease as one of the hundreds of things that are in it and i'll just say here's the recipe and then if you have more severe you have hawthorne magnesium aspartate and it goes on um so, so what, what did you what did you prescribe to him you prescribed uh d-ribose hawthorne and i didn't do the hawthorne but i gave okay. him the ribose b vitamins magnesium coenzyme q10 had he not responded to that i would have added hawthorne and magnesium aspartate for the aspartate mm -hmm. component for the aspartic the aspartic acid and no, what what I actually don't know what that does on the heart. It just it, this is a Russian study where they gave it to people with heart failure versus a placebo group. Um, they found a fifty percent more survival rate with a marked increase in function. So the mechanism in the Krebs cycle or whichever cycle I don't know. It's just that it, it was one of those simple studies that nobody hears about because it's cheap stuff. Mm -hmm and but it was a double blind study so excellent um so you know there's a lot can be done now what if you have the fatigue brain fog maybe insomnia widespread pain uh long covid that's what i'm really calling the long covid and that affects about 15 percent of people who have covid who are symptomatic um the shine protocol works very well because long COVID is this post viral chronic fatigue syndrome. It's the 576th type of infection. I'm pulling that number out of my arse, but basically there are dozens of infections that can trigger chronic fatigue syndrome and son of a gun, COVID is one of them. MERS yeah. is one of them. SARS is one of them. All of these are doing about the same numbers and it's going to fall out. I think 15%. Uh, if you go out six months. Um, so the sign protocol works. And you, there's four studies we've done in the last two years. Uh, two were on a peptide, um, uh, bind tripeptides called recovery factors, not available in the US, available everywhere in the United States, besides you, everywhere in the world, besides the US. Um, these, these, these are peptides that are oral peptides. What, what's um, the name of this, this specific peptide? Recovery factors. Is it like BPC-157? I'm not familiar with that one. It says okay. or, oral serum-based uh, bipeptide product. Okay. And we did one study where we took people who had low uh, immune function. We basically, specifically the IgG and IgG1 to 4 subsets were low. Um, so we took a subgroup of those. Um, and in the recovery factors group, it went up 14% which is quite substantial. Um, energy went up uh, about 60%, um, cognition improved. So for those of you who are outside of the United States, you can go to recoveryfactors.com um, and you can get it, make a big difference. Um, I would definitely do that. Um, another study was the HRG80 study. Uh, ginseng is a powerful herb, but then it basically became pretty useless or not very good because it got uh, hunted out. You had to use the wild ginseng and that went up to about $900 a pound in, in countries where the total income might have been $900 a year or less. Um, so you can imagine it got hunted out pretty much. Um, but they've developed a hydroponic way to create the same levels of active components. Um, and this stuff's been pretty remarkable. I tried it myself and it was like, you know, in fact, on busy days, I take one. Um, and it's, it's cheap, it's a chewable capsule, a chewable tablet is the one I would recommend. But in the study, this was 188 people in the study, half of them had post-viral chronic fatigue. Um, and the effects on energy and stamina were, were quite dramatic. Um, so that's, that's why I started that as the first thing, because it's just one pill. Recovery factors is eight pills a day. It's cheap, it's one pill. It's just easy and it can be taken as needed. Um, and then the other one, the smart energy system that I mentioned, uh, that we just got the data back from the statistician. I was very happy to see it was quite stunning data. Um, and um, 
also for the post viral fatigue group that worked well. So, and those were the brain fog, low dose naltrexone. It's a prescription made by compounding pharmacies, not expensive, about 80 cents a day. Um, need to take it at bedtime for about six to eight weeks at about the eight week mark. Uh, the effect on the cognitive function because of what's called microglial activation is what that's approaching and helping. Um, fairly marked, quite very, very good. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do um, post-viral and post-COVID uh, persistent symptoms. Again, this is all very, very treatable. It's just the problem is not lack of effective uh, treatment, but lack of effective physician education. Uh, they are waiting. You have to understand most uh, what's called continuing medical education by physicians um, has been described by a past editor of New England Journal of Medicine as slick advertising masquerading as science. Mm -hmm. It's, we'd like to think we're evidence-based. Medicine is not evidence-based. Medicine is money-based. And if something is profitable, it will be packaged by the PR departments of the industry. And these are nice people. They're all good people. They're not, not a bad person. I've, they're some of the nicest people I've ever met. But their job is to sell drugs and, and, and get rid of the competition. Um, and basically, you, you look at the conferences, you look even at the journals at who's paying the ads. There's no advertisements um, for golf clubs or Lexuses in these journals because no company in their right mind would pay what it come up, 15,000 for a page that they hide where nobody sees it. Mm -hmm. So are the drug companies incredibly stupid or are they putting these advertisements because they know that if they advertise in this journal, their studies will get published. The editor will find a reviewer who happens to work for that company. Yeah. The send it to. Um, so, you know, another editor of New England Journal of Medicine uh, put very bluntly, uh, that she knows it brings it said it with no pleasure I state that I no longer believe much of what I read in medical journals anymore. So again, what the journal conclusion tells me when I look at studies is it tells me who paid for the study. Then when I tear the data apart and the methodology, it tells me what the study actually shows. And often that has nothing to do with what the results are being reported as. Right. Yeah, I think this is, again, not to dig digress in COVID stuff, but I think this is critically important for people to understand right now because there's a huge percentage of the population that is operating under the, the very naive assumption that what goes on in science is, you know, just sort of, you know, like this idea of it. And I had the same idea when I was younger that it's just sort of all the most brilliant minds in the world just trying to help people and, um, find answers to to all of our problems, and it's all just honestly presented to the world. And you know, there's an element of truth in that. There's a lot of good people, well-meaning people, brilliant people who are working in the field of science. And it's also the case that that is highly corrupted by financial interests. Yeah, and they're all good people. There are no bad people. I haven't met a bad person out there in any of this. It's just the institutions are corrupt. The people mm -hmm. are good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, are there any concluding thoughts that you have? Actually, I have a, a question out of just pure curiosity. You've mentioned a couple of times that you did the shine protocol and you did a, it was randomized placebo controlled study. How do you mm -hmm. do a placebo controlled study? We didn't for control a lifestyle the exercise. We did not control exercise. Both groups yeah. had the exercises able and we, uh, for the diet uh, that wasn't controlled. Okay. So you're controlling the, the supplements mainly supplements versus and the medications and the medications. Okay. Got it. Got it. I was, I was, my brain was yeah. going crazy. It, this whole, this it, whole it conversation was for, the, to... for this, for this study, it was the shin protocol. <laughs> shin, yes. No, yeah. Okay. So you've, you mentioned you've done four studies in the last two years and you've mentioned at least two of those. Well, can there are the you, two, two studies on recovery course? factors and one study on HRG80 red ginseng and one on smart energy system. These are open studies. They were done in people who qualified for severe CFS and fibromyalgia. Uh, their energy level had to be a five or less overall on a zero to 10 visual analog scale. Uh, the study was about a month of basically doing the treatment. There was pre and post visual analog scale and self-rating. Got it. Excellent. 
Um, one more random question on ribose. Ribose is something that generally generally requires larger doses, and meaning multigram amounts as opposed to milligram amounts. Um, yes. A and um, there are some people, there's a subset of people who seem to be reactive to ribose where it causes hypoglycemia. I'm curious yeah. if Low you adrenal. have- it, okay. So that's, that's what you feel causes that, the hypoglycemia? It's, clear, it's, it's clearly what happened. Well, here's okay. the thing. The, no, but it causes the reactions. Uh, so basically, ribose in the studies routinely lowers blood sugar. So it will directly do that by energy consumption. But most people, their adrenal function is fine. And it takes care of that and just brings the blood sugar back up before they have symptoms. But if people have symptoms from the ribose where they get irritable or they get hyper, they, that to me, it's almost like a provocative test for adrenal fatigue. Mm. And then I have them take adrenal support. And then usually one, they feel better from the adrenal support and two, they can then tolerate the ribose. Got it. Okay. Um, one more question on ribose. I have seen some studies me, I'm forgetting some of the details of this, but I've seen some studies where they've actually shown ribose can lead to enhanced glycation of tissues. Have you, are you familiar with any of that? And does it yes, concern you at all? I, I don't, the answer is I don't know. Okay. So Got it. it's, I've not seen any problems from that, and, but that is a question mark. Okay. Got it. Um, Dr. Teitelbaum, this has been awesome. I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, do you have any concluding thoughts if you were going to leave people with sort of three key things you want people to take away from this or to, to remember if they're trying to improve their energy? What would they be? Number one, if you get yourself more energy so you can go back to life that totally sucks, you've done nothing for yourself. Mm. Okay, so use that energy for things that feel good, um, not for things you think you should do. And if you think you should do it, but it makes you feel awful, don't do it. Your body will call you on it and pull you over to the side of the road. It's like, you know, until you get it, use it for what feels good. I'm not talking about go out and shoot up heroin, but what feels good and what works for you. Um, number two, a uh, simple way to begin, again, is with the nutritional stuff, cut out sugar. Um, for most of you who have fatigue, increase salt and water. Uh, unless you have heart failure. Uh, salt has a minimal effect on blood pressure, contrary to one millimeter in most people. That's all the effect it has. Um, and use the smart energy system, use the energy revitalization system, use the HRG80. These are quick, simple things you can do uh, that will dramatically increase energy. And then go ahead and, you know, your body has a little bit of a use it or lose it approach to exercise. When you go out and exercise, find something that's fun and do it with a friend. Because if you have a scheduled time where somebody else is going to show up, you're going to show up even though, and if not, you're going to have an excuse. Well, I can't today because I have to scratch my ass. You know, you'll find, you know how the mind comes up with all the excuses. Like, well, we can't do it today. Yeah. Uh, but if you're doing it with a friend and it's fun, uh, going shopping is exercise. Uh, sex is exercise. Go use your willpower to get out there. Once you're out there, let it be fun. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed this, Dr. Teitelbaum. And, and where can people uh, follow your work or, or learn more about what you're doing or get in touch with you? Well, the book From Fatigue to Fantastic uh, will give the information, get the blue cover. Um, for informational website, vitality101.com. Uh, for products, I do have those at end fatigue.com. Uh, my email address is fatigue, F-A-T-I-G-U-E, D-O-C, like doctor, at gmail.com. Um, so, you know, if you have questions, uh, that's my personal email address. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And on a personal note, thank you for writing a nice little blurb on uh, my upcoming <laughs> book, Eat for Energy, which is coming out in May. I, I really appreciate you looking through that and, and writing a nice endorsement of it. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Be well, everybody. Bye -bye. Yes. <laughs>
Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.